Hello and welcome to Aimless Ramblings. Uh, today we're going to have a bit of a chat about both the sanctity and value of life. Uh, I'm going to kick off today, so we're going to have a bit of a discussion and a chat about an incident that occurred in 20, 2006 uh, when the mountaineer David Sharp attempted to summit Everest. Uh, he is believed to have succeeded to have summited Everest, but on the way back down, uh, under the stresses of a potentially a cerebral edema and also hypothermia, he sought shelter in uh, a cave which is right near where the rather famous body uh, of the green booted climber is uh, now the reason why this is somewhat interesting as uh, as a topic compared to the numerous other climbers who have died on Everest is that a large number of climbers actually passed by uh, David Sharp whilst he was going through the process of dying over several hours uh, and it became extremely controversial in the uh, the media. Basically, you had several uh, different climbers, including Mark Inglis, who was a very famous uh, double amputee New Zealand climber, who, who went past the body as they themselves were making their summit push. Now, some of the climbers claimed that they actually thought that uh, Dave Sharp was actually the body of Green's Boots. Uh, other people said that when they saw him, uh, they already thought that he was too far gone, although it should be noted that two Sherpas did actually stop and give him some supplemental oxygen at some stage. Uh, but uh, Mark Inglis really came under a lot of controversy and a, a lot of uh, criticism, including from Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, for not helping Sharp, uh, even attempting to try to get him down from a, such a high altitude. Uh, and The question I want to ask is, realistically, in, in these kinds of environments, we see people who are risking their own lives uh, to get to the top. And that's one thing. But we also see people who would be willing, uh, and I mean, for these people who have gone to climb Everest, they've invested tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, in some cases, we're talking about people who have spent several months of their lives all pushing to get to the top of the mountain. Uh, at what point and at what level should we be willing to pass up on the life of another person? And really, what is kind of, uh, the value of another person's life to us when we're in the push for an endeavour. So I'll, I'll probably throw it to you guys uh, now, Simon and Sam, uh, because I don't want to hog it, but it, it's really more of a, a thought-provoking question rather than a recount of this specific instance of uh, people ignoring another person's life uh, to a achieve their own goals. Yeah. Um, so, like, from my perspective, I think it's just a bit trash to walk past a dying person and let them die. Like, I don't think you can, you know, okay, tens of thousand dollars, a shit ton of money. And, you know, like, possibly you're going to miss out on a, um, a once-in-a-lifetime event. And possibly you wouldn't even be able to save the guy. But you're walking past a person dying and just letting them die so you can get to the top of a mountain. That that just doesn't quite sit right with me. You know, like, what I'm if Okay, it's like, I guess, take that was where do you draw the line if I'm really fucking going for a Mac is, you know, I, I want a Big Mac. Old mate down the roads, bleeding out. Shit, if I call the ambulance, I kind of have to hang around. Mm. You know, obviously, no, no one's, well, not no one, but not many people are going to walk on by someone dying to get McDonald's, but where does it become acceptable, I guess? Mm. Simon? Um, well, as you were discussing, not very many people would, um, however, there's a whole entire effect based around it, which is the bystander effect, that if there's enough people, everybody thinks it's somebody else's job, so mm, most people will just course. walk on by. Uh, one of the best examples was um, this woman got uh, killed over like a series of, like I think it was four to five hours. Like he, mm. <laughs> The guy had time to incapacitate her. He left, he came back, but because it was between two apartment buildings and everybody else had thought they called the police, nobody called the police. As you're discussing, you know, if you're by yourself, you're more likely to go and, you know... So if you, by yourself, are going to, you know, Macca's, and it's, like, yeah. early morning, you're like, oh, I'm the only one that's going to be seeing this, you're more likely to stop and help than if, you know, it's in the middle of, you know, the city and, you know, some homeless man's getting stabbed. You're like, oh, one of the other people to probably do it. Mm. So I suppose um, an interesting one to bring up with this is probably there's a, <laughs> a moral philosopher, an Australian, actually, called Peter Singer. And uh, his argument is actually... Uh, 
something along the similar lines of what Sam's mentioned here, he says that, well, if you're in a park and you're wearing a brand new set of really expensive shoes, but you see a child drowning in a pond, no one else is around, no one's going to know if you jumped in and saved the child or didn't save the child. Almost everybody, at least everyone socially conditioned and uh, yeah, sort of yeah. functionally working within the society, is going to jump in and save the child. However, <clears throat> his arguments then like, well, if you're willing to sacrifice a very expensive set of shoes to save one child here right now, why aren't you willing to you know, sacrifice a significant portion of your income, every single one of us in the entirety of our society, to save the lives of millions of children overseas. So he, he's a big advocate, essentially, for people uh, to... He, he calls it uh, responsible giving. Basically, he talks about people taking as much of their income as possible can be given away and then donating it uh, to saving children o o overseas and abroad, uh, or, or people more generally. So he's looking pure numbers, quantitative numbers, uh, mm. just saving people. And I suppose, uh, in some ways, his argument ignores what we've been talking about, both of the bystander effect a little bit, but also particularly when you said that Macca's example is a proximity. And I think uh, moral weight has a lot to do with proximity and, in some ways, moral like diffusion of moral responsibility, whether that be because of our distance from the people who are suffering or, in the case of what Simon was talking about, because we think it's not our responsibility is, is a pretty significant factor which needs to be considered. So in the David Sharp case, many of these people, uh, when they saw that he was dying, they also knew that they were potentially risking their own lives in trying to save him. But when there were so many other people that already walked past him, like, it's not my responsibility. Um, so, yeah, like, just going off what you said, so I just, like, did some napkin maths there on Australia's um, foreign aid budget. So, it's $160 a person, approximately, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like he's got a fairly valid argument there, you know. If we're spending $160 per person on foreign aid, maybe we should be doing better. That's 160 bucks ain't a lot. Well, uh, I suppose another thing as well is that aid is in, isn't in and of itself purely about... Uh, achieving development aims or uh, saving individual lives. AIDS is also has a, aid, I should say, not AIDS, has <laughs> a uh, particularly important uh, role from a securitization standpoint of preventing instability in nearby countries that could have flow on effects for the economy of Australia. So it's not altruistic either. Yeah, well, no, I don't really think anything is ever altruistic, but yeah. Well, uh, uh, one other thing I would say uh, when it comes to moral distance is uh, there's a rather good book called On Killing uh, by, I think it's David Grossman. Uh, and basically, he talks about um, soldiers and the act of killing. And what it tends to be is the psychological trauma that an individual undergoes through the act of killing uh, tends to be diminished on the basis of how far away they are from the person they're killing. So, for instance, a pilot dropping a bomb has nowhere near the same level of psychological trauma as, say, for instance, someone on the ground, like an infantier with a gun or a bayonet. Uh, and also, um, when it's a crew of people operating a weapon system, for instance, a artillery piece as opposed to an individual operating a single weapon system, uh, once again, the moral responsibility is diffused and therefore they don't suffer so much of a psychological or moral injury as it's sometimes called. So, I'm going to anything to add to that? Um, well, as you're mentioning, like, the psychological and moral in injury, it uh, sort of reminds me of um, the whole entire build-up of how crime occurs because crime in and of itself as a concept and as social beings is actually counterintuitive and it's all about this like sort of diffusion of responsibility diffusion of blame diffusion of all these different elements and as you discussed like when there's more people there's what on but also it's like your mindset going in there and continuing on with the war example you were talking about how like um infantrymen would have a bit of an issue but um if you can dehumanize the opponent it stops being as difficult to complete your job. Somebody did the next step in the trolley exam where they talked about, well, you know, what happens if it's one person that you know versus five strangers? And that's that kind of thing of, like, how much social 
capital you've put into a mm. relationship with another human being. That can also well, affect. I do remember um, some time ago um, there was a discussion about the idea of the monkey sphere, and what it is is like um, if you look at sphere primates, of monkeys, clearly. <laughs> clearly, but basically, if you look at look at primates on the basis of um, the size of their brain, you can pretty accurately, well, I wouldn't say necessarily causation, but there's a correlation between that and the size of the groups that they cohabitate in. But the the thing is, is that if you extrapolate that sort of thinking of size of brain to social grouping uh, to humans, uh, I think we sit somewhere around about the 120 person mark. So there is an argument that they make that. If you ex- you sort of exist in a world where we live in this rather sophisticated, interconnected, and organically grown society, but we as individuals only really have a true emotional attachment to kind of about 120 people. Everyone outside that that monkey sphere is kind of a bit like a cardboard cutout and a bit of a statistic. So, like for instance, that's why um, if uh, you know one of you two die, I'm probably going to be pretty upset. Whereas if somebody yeah. five five doors down, uh, you know, who I've maybe seen walking the dog once or twice dies, I'm going to be like, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the best example where this goes to extremes is like when you hear about, you know, uh, somebody in your local town was, you know, robbed today. And you're like, oh, that's horrible. But then you hear about like 750 people died in Malaysia today. And you're like, okay, that, that's horrific, but... That's a lot of numbers, and I don't really know anybody there, so, yeah. Well, I suppose, talking about numbers, I think you, Sam, had crunched some numbers, or at least looking at some numbers when it came Stole to... Other uh, people's numbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly, human life and, and value. Yeah, um, so I thought it would be, you know, intriguing to have a look at the um, value of statistical life, which is, um, I guess, an economic concept, essentially, to try and put a dollar figure to what a society or a group views as a um, like appropriate price, and like the spread internationally is huge. So like in Turkey, it's incredibly low. Um, a lot of places have a broad range within it. So like the U.S. ranges between three and nine million for a statistical life. Um, Russia um, is something like half a million to ten million. So I guess they depend on who you're thinking of, but um. The way the Australian government's gone about doing it is actually, um, instead of, like, a lot of countries just ask people, like, you know, how much is a person's life worth to you? Um, they've had a look at how much you, as a consumer, as such, are willing to spend to increase your safety. You know, like, if, it's say, a car with better airbags is 20 grand more, are you interested in spending that 20 grand, you know, to decrease the risk of you dying quite smallly? Or say, if you were a coal miner, right, and you've got a really risky job, and they find a way of bringing in a safety feature, and they say, hey guys, if we bring in this safety feature, you're going to get a pay cut, because your job's not as difficult anymore. Are you guys cool with that? And you know, like, if the pay cut is too big, people just go, well, no, I'd rather risk my life. Um, the number it comes to anyway for Australia is 4.2 million um, for a statistical life. Which means, like, as I was talking before that we started, um, it's uh, 17 cents per person Australia as a society is willing to spend to save a life. Which is a pretty small number. But um, it's got quite useful applications. So um, I think it was the US's uh, Clean Air Act in the 1990s. Like anyone who's a little bit older will remember, like, you know, you can't breathe the air in Los Angeles, like the smog, all this jazz. Um, it cost them, like, $500 billion to implement the Clean Air Act. Like, it's not cheap. Like, a huge investment, $500 billion. Um, but they've done a little calculation on the, um, you know, taking the US EPA's $9 million for the value of a life. Um, and the cost saved as such in terms of human life is, it's a huge spread. But I guess it makes sense. Between 5.6 and 49 trillion dollars. Yeah, something costs us money, but it's entirely possible. You know, be saving a lot of lives. And I guess to go back to your point, Tim, is you know, they left 4.2 million dollars on that mountain when they walked past it. Yeah. True. I suppose. I suppose. Um, 
particularly when you're talking about government policy and policy descriptions, like one of the hardest things dealing with in the policy sphere is always going to be uh, trying to quantify things which are inherently intangible. So like things like what is the value of a human life in terms of pure money, like as we've shown, seems to be quite intangible depending from one society to the next. Mm. And so for instance, does that mean when we're talking about foreign aid budgets, should we be calculating the, the cost of the lives that we're saving on the basis of our numbers yeah, or on the n- numbers of, of there are these other countries? Sorry, Simon, you had something to say? Oh, yeah. If you watch one of our previous podcasts, we discuss uh, the ambiguity of value. Yeah, we actually do. How about <laughs> that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but mm. also as a continuation of that whole entire concept of uh, financial spending in relation to human life, does it also work the opposite way when it comes to people who are actually a threat to society? So how do we uh, even out that whole entire concept? Because obviously it's not a cr- crime to be dying on a mountain, but like, yes, you said they left, left that amount of money up there, but what ha- if they invested their lives and maybe the lives of their compatriots to try and help him, and then you lose four or five times that amount Yeah, exactly. on the that. descent? Yeah, and so, you know... The guy on the mountain, essentially guaranteed death, right? He's he's going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, you know, there's a 10% chance that the people helping him are going to die, you know, if there's 10 people helping him, well, now it's worse. And mm-hmm. no one knows those numbers. And, like, I think it was a diver. Um, some cave system in the US drowned, right? And mm-hmm. unsurprisingly, he wanted to get the guy's body back. And I think four or five people died, like, one after the other, attempting to recover these bodies before they just went, look, um, we should probably stop this. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a pretty big one when it comes to adventure sports more broadly. Like, so some of these sports, like, for instance, extreme mountaineering and also the cave diving, like, there is such high uh, rates of fatality that occurred during the process of these actual sports that the, the argument has been made like so if you yourself individually want to take these risks that's one thing but it's another thing entirely also to be then risking the pe- the lives of people who are coming to try and bring your body back etc and mm. when it comes to things like Everest for instance um, you know is it really a choice for some of the Sherpas in particular who are going up there where yeah. there is no necessarily other economic opportunities which are as, as lucrative in the country. Are you really yeah. offering them a choice when you're putting their lives in danger to, do, to realistically, for a lot of people, what is now just a bucket list ticking exercise? Yeah, exactly. Really good point. But um, I was going to say on top of that, that you brought out a really key aspect of this, I suppose, is that we can very comfortably from our armchairs uh, talk about the 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 mathematics of, of like oh this life is worth saving that life isn't worth saving but in the moment uh, it's pretty difficult for the individual to make these uh sort of well re- well we would call rational but at the same time kind of fuzzy decisions let alone uh go through the calculations it's really kind of people acting off gut instinct and one oh, thing definitely. i would like to ask simon pro- Simon probably from a criminology aspect is if you take pure life value in terms of like economic value uh, you can come to a pretty convincing argument for the death penalty would you you agree or disagree with that well in terms of if an individual living is economically detrimental compared to that individual just being killed uh, for instance say someone is an extremely violent psychopath uh, who you know, is constantly uh, assaulting, attempting murder in a prison setting. And uh, to keep them in complete solitary confinement in in line with the standards uh, which are set by the society, so you can't just, like, you know, lock them up in a cave and throw, like, raw meat in there, like, a la ancient Greece or something, um, <coughs> is ta- costing the taxpayer uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on a daily basis. You could come to the argument, though, like, well, this this individual is never going to contribute to society, cannot be rehabilitated. And uh, first, that's an, uh, a question for Simon. Is there such a thing as an irreconcilable uh, uh, person that cannot be reintegrated into society? And then you could argue from an economic perspective that they they should be you know, put through a death penalty. Ironically, their value doesn't actually come from their ability to be within society. Um, so you find in a lot of those cases where there's like a really like outraged person that, 
you usually give the death penalty. Um, they're usually very good uh, for uh, academic study. So that's actually usually where they get a lot of use. Plus, also, you got to realize that their simple existence is creating jobs. Because there has to be somebody. So, yeah, I know it sounds like, oh, you're spending a lot for it. But also, they're putting people in a job to <laughs> keep them maintained. I know that sounds, like, really <laughs> ridiculous. But that is... Pr- the best yeah, way to no, describe it's it... Yeah, it's the concept that corrections and, like, prisons work in isolation from police and from jurisdiction of, like, uh, courts and whatnot. So what the courts deem irreconcilable and what the police deem irreconcilable, the uh, incarceration might not. And it's all about what we expect of, oh, well, he's going to go back into society and, you know, become a plumber might not be the outcome that you're going to be able to get for him, but you might be able to get something, for example, uh, if we want to know about, you know, violent behavior, offending. He's a perfect case study, and then he has nothing to do. And a lot of these people, um, especially people in prison for long periods of time, are more than happy to do research because it means it gets them out of the room or it gets them to actually have conversations with people. So that's how you get people to fill in a lot of studies. Because I'm, I'm sure most people are more than happy to do a couple of questions and find out what kind of cheese sandwich they are, but they're not willing to do 2,000 word, um, 2,000 question questionnaires once a month ongoing like you get to like the first one you're like oh this is hard then they're like do you want to do it again next month they're like no but that's the kind of stuff you can do with somebody who is lifelong incarcerated ah so so we can turn them into uh test test pig, do guinea pigs <laughs> that also has a nice feedback mm-hmm. loop because what it does is it means that next time we run into somebody that's similar to that we actually can probably help them return to society because we realize what those triggers and what are. Um, Sam, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, I I guess it's more just a statement in broad about the death penalty, I guess, you know. um, I think uh, the wrongful conviction rate in Australia sits around 8% or something like that. And it's probably actually higher than that because, you know, it's only 8% where people have actually, you know, had the means or the willpower to, you know, get their cases revoked. Um, So, you know, if we're killing people... You know, 8% of them to 10% of them shouldn't be actually being killed and don't pose a threat to society, then all of a sudden those numbers start really adding up. I would agree with that, and that's like the kinds of arguments that people like. Yeah, um, I think it's a reasonably solid one. And a rent of made, like, yeah. But uh, I mean, what is it? There's also the argument that the conviction doesn't matter as to whether or not it's right or wrong. It's about a matter of maintaining social control. But that's more when you start getting into like crazy absolute sadists like authoritarian marxists i was going to say though sam um that i think simon had something extra to say about the value of human life more broadly you were talking about assisting somebody so that sort of brought me to the concept of what happens when that's your job so i was looking at paramedics and obviously we've had an issue with paramedics who are getting assaulted and whatnot but uh more specifically what scope can a paramedic work within and uh, one of the most interesting things i found is uh the major indicator of whether somebody will make like overly uh, personal risk to try and save somebody is actually whether they've been in the... It's like the length of time they've been a paramedic. Uh, so if you're very new to being a paramedic, you're more likely to be a stickler for every single rule and subset. So, you know, for example, oh, they're too close to this power line, so I'm not going to help them, or, you know... The dog is bark at me, too close thing. But the older you get, the more you start to blur those lines and sort of like find little uh, loopholes to help people, which I, I thought it would be all right because like what most of the people think is, oh, well, they're straight out of uni or they're straight out of study. So they'll be all gun ho and want to, you know, overshoot them up. But they're the more likely to be more reserved and more protective of their own safety. So that, that's what I personally found interesting about that sort of uh, how much is a life worth it gets valued higher the longer they've been in the profession. Interesting. So I wonder in some ways maybe is that because if you've been in the profession longer, you've internalised the identity of a paramedic more, which means you're more willing to risk your own life to do something you think that a good paramedic would do, which is saving lives. It's a combination of is it like its identity? Is it that 
is it could it just be aging out? Because um, there's also been a lot of research on the concept that very early in life and very late in life, you stop actually as much caring about. Like obviously there's outliers with everything, but uh, there seems to be like sort of a downturn. But then there's also this weird middle point where people stop caring about their safety, but that's more because they think they're bulletproof. So it's mm. working out, is it that they're becoming more thing, or is it that they're valuing their life less? Could it be also an addiction <laughs> to um, the rush of the job? Oh, true. Uh, adrenaline kind of yeah, kind of concept. Yeah. yeah. Either way, thank you for your service. Ambulance people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank yes. you. Especially when you're being assaulted by random people all the time. Right. Mm. Yes. Well, I think that we haven't really solved the problem. And I don't think it is something that can really be solved because of, as we've talked about, the inherent vagueness of value. Once you reapply that to human life, uh, it, it starts to, to get a bit messy. And I, I do think as well that um, we are sort of guided by our own anthro uh, anthrocentric bias being that we ourselves are humans and we like being alive and therefore of course we're going to value life i mean that's the the joke which george carlin made many years ago like you know you never hear dead people arguing about the sanctity of life um (laughs) well anyway um thank you very much gentlemen for another riveting conversation uh and i think we'll talk about something maybe a little less morbid next time I doubt it. Cheers, and thank you once again to our listeners, uh, and I hope to see you next time.